programmatic and manipulation of the time specifiers. So what you can do beyond the normal errors. So uh, good morning everyone. Thanks for coming back from the break to hear this uh, exciting talk. Um, over the last uh, several years, I worked off and on with types and type specifiers in common list. And uh, there's, there's no problem that I encountered that was insurmountable. But uh, there's, there's some difficulty that the specification, or that the native approach gives. And I want to introduce today a data structure that I encountered which uh, seems to ease the, the, uh, the pain quite a bit. Um, so the, uh, the order of the talk is we're going to talk first about uh, the ways that the specification natively describes how to manipulate, uh, manipulate types. And I'm going to look at this data structure called the um, ROBDD, which we'll talk about uh, in more detail. How to do the same type of operations in, with BDDs as you do with type specifiers. So first off, um, types in common list are defined as sets. So a type such as float is the set of all objects in the language which are a float. And operations between types correspond to operations between sets. So uh, sets can be subsets uh, of each other. So uh, float is a sub set of uh, subtype of number because the set of floats is a subset of a set of numbers. Types can be intersecting, such as fixed num and unsigned bytes have a common intersection. Uh, sets can be disjoint, float and fixed num. There's no object in the language of both a float and a fixed num. Uh, type specifiers, uh, the meta language of the DSL, domain specific language for describing types, is very intuitive and, and quite powerful. You can do a lot with it. So, what you see is what you get is what homo iconicity means. The symbol integer stands for the integer type. We have compound specifiers, such as the set of objects, which if you call odd key, the function returns true. So, the set of objects which satisfy the odd key function. We can express Boolean relations between types with and, or, and not. So a set of objects which are either a string or a number and don't satisfy function like that. There's an empty type as there's an empty list. So it's, it's called nil, but you can express it in many ways. So the intersection of number and string is empty. So one way to uh, denote the empty type is and number string, and you can have some devious ways of describing the empty type, such as the set of objects which satisfy both even and odd, odd feet, which is of course an empty set as well. So from that you see that the type specification is not unique in the sense of any type can be expressed in, it turns out, infinitely many, uncountable infinitely many ways. Uh, there are type relationships just as there are set relationships. You can ask whether an object is a member of a type by type key. Whether one type is totally enclosed in another type with subtype P is asked the question, is T1 a subset subtype of T2? Uh, type equivalence, so given two types, T1 and T2, is T1 a subtype of T2 and T2 is a subtype of T1, then the types are equivalent, just as uh, the standard set equivalent test. And you can ask whether two types are disjoint. So do they have anything in common, any objects in common? By calculating the intersection and asking if the intersection is subtype of nil. This is the standard trick for finding out whether uh, two types are disjoint. Um, sometimes type P unfortunately returns don't know instead of true or false. Uh, it might do this because some type subtype P questions are unanswerable in the sense of uh, you would have to solve the halting problem to, to figure it out. But uh, sometimes type P returns don't know for a, a reason which is very good for the compiler generator, the person writing the compiler, but is infuriating to the application programmer such as myself. So the, the standard allows subtype P to give up if the question is too hard and just return don't know. And 
a, uh, a compliant implementation of subtype B is not required to always answer the question when it's answerable. Uh, here, an example of, of two type specifiers. I hope that nobody in the room understands this. My, my, uh, my goal is to come up with something that you can imagine what it probably, how you would manipulate it, but what it means is not, it's not exactly clear. Oops. Um, if you were going to use one of these types to ask, is an object an element of one of these types, you can imagine that a naive implementation of type P might have to, for example, with T2, given an object, ask, is it a fixed num, ask, is it a rational, ask, is it a number, and then ask, is it a number again, in the not number P, uh, number part, and in the second uh, clause, you have the same questions again. So a naive implementation might check the same typeness many times, and ideally you'd like that check to only happen once. So we can do a bit better than that. I want to introduce this data structure called the reduced ordered binary decision diagram. So this is a data structure which rather than using the native list implementation of types, uh, actually adds some structure to this. One thing that you notice is that a type expression as a Boolean uh, expression can be easily transformed into uh, expression just from Boolean algebra. Um, there's a very clear isomorphic relationship between these two. So for the moment, forget that we're talking about types at all and just think about talking about Boolean equations of Boolean variables, of binary variables. So if we order the variables, we have to specify some particular order. There's volumes written about what the best order is for different applications. But uh, given an order of the variables, a unique truth table uh, exists. And we can represent the truth table as a binary truth. So the, the green arrow leaving A means that we're assuming A is false, uh, it's true, and the red dotted arrow uh, means that A is false. Okay? And so every path from the root to a leaf represents one row in the truth table. So this row, row represents that A is true because we're following the green arrow, B is false because we're following the red arrow from B. C is false and D is true. So we get true in the truth table. And what that means is that Boolean expression there evaluates to true if those variables are uh, as assigned. Uh, similarly, uh, if A is false, B is true, C is true, and D is false, the expression evaluates to false. So given any Boolean expression of four variables, regardless of how complicated it is, it can be evaluated by simply walking through the binary tree in n steps. So the, the evaluation is linear. Um, unfortunately, the size of the binary tree is exponential. So although we can evaluate expressions very quickly, we can't store the binary tree so efficiently in memory. Uh, we need 31 nodes to represent four variables, and if we, double, if we add a variable, we double the size of the tree. So we can do a bit better. There are three standard reductions that you find uh, in many resources about uh, binary decision diagrams. The first obvious one is that the leaf nodes don't have to be represented individually. They can be represented with, um, with uh, uh, singleton objects. So uh, just representing T and L by one object each. So this already divides the size of the tree in half. So big, big step forward. The second uh, reduction is called the deletion rule. And what this means is that uh, if, do I have a corner? No. <laughs> That's an infrared corner. Do I have a corner? Okay. So I'll do this again. Music, please. Actually, I can walk over there. <laughs> so uh, the, the D node, for example, it's green and red arrow points in the same place. So the D node can be removed, and the arrow pointing to it can be updated to point to the thanks. Can be updated to point to the, uh, the node that D points to. Okay, so all of these nodes uh, whose green and red arrow point in the same place 
can be simply deleted. So the tree becomes, a, or the, the diagram becomes much smaller, and then you see that that same uh, simplification can be done multiple times because the C node now has both of its arrows pointing to the same place, so it can be removed, and the pointer then just be updated from the pointing to it. The second, or the third uh, rule is called the merger rule, and this says if you have two nodes and the green arrows point to the same place and the red arrows point to the same place, they can be merged together. So it can be merged into the same D. And that uh, simplification can also be done multiple times. So in the end, we come up with uh, a, a diagram of eight nodes, which is a big improvement over the original 31. And we started with this expression, and now we have a, a tree, uh, a diagram that represents that expression. Note that the, in no way does the diagram depend on the syntax of this expression. It only depends on the truth table. So any Boolean expression, which is equivalent to this, will have the exact same Boolean uh, dis decision diagram. Okay? And there's a standard algorithm for serializing that back into some canonical form, as we see here. Um, the, uh, the paper talks about that uh, algorithm is not very complicated, but uh, this canonical form is in no way minimum. What we started with was a lot prettier and human, more human readable. But when we get out here is a canonical form that any Boolean expression equivalent to that would then reduce to this canonical form. Uh, so that was uh, assuming that we were using Boolean variables and Boolean algebra. What if we tried to plug back in the common list pipe system into this? Uh, and we tried to look at this expression and number and not string and compute its diagram and the type just number in its diagram. But if we think about it, there are no numbers which are also strings. So this type is equivalent to this type. But they have different diagrams, unfortunately, which is, violates what I just promised you on the, on the previous slide. So in the common list uh, type system, we can express relationships where the diagrams don't reduce uh, to the same structure as we would like. So uh, in a uh, very quick review, we started with uh, looking at CL types as Boolean expressions. Uh, we constructed the BDDs, went through the standard reduction tricks of the terminal rule, the deletion rule, the merging rule, um, and we unfortunately lack this unique representation uh, property, which, uh, which we have for, for Boolean algebra. So it doesn't quite work like we want. We need a solution. So what I'm suggesting is we add an additional rule uh, additional rule called the subtype rule. The way this works is, if we think about it, the problem is that number and string are disjoint, which means number and string obey a certain subtype relationship. In particular, <coughs> string is a subtype of the complement of number. Okay? And in fact, there are eight possible subtype relationships between two sets, uh, and I'm using P and C to mean the parent and the child node. Parent can be a subtype of child, subset of child, a subset of the complement of the child, a complement of the parent can be a sub, uh, type of the child, etc. So eight different possibilities. In this case, uh, the algorithm, the, the subtype rule says when we're searching uh, a child, such as we're searching the green child number, the green child, and we find this relationship, not number is a super type of child then we can reduce string to string's red child. So the red child of string is true, so we can replace string with true. So this type uh, diagram reduces to this diagram. So we have now a way of, of making common list types, two different common list uh, type syntaxes which represent the same type, reduced to the same tree. There are a few other cases which are explained in the paper. This is the, the, the main trick you have to do, and there's a few other ones that if you're interested, I, I encourage you to, to, to look at the paper. But given uh, two binary diagrams represent types, we can still ask the same questions which we could ask before with the native type system. So we can ask whether two types are the same, whether types are disjoint, whether one type is a subtype of the other. 
And we need the, these three functions, BDD and BDD or and BDD and not, which take BDD objects, combine them in, in well-defined ways, and come up with an object that represents the, the, the resulting uh, combination. If we look at these two types, uh, I can't look at that with my eyes and know are that they represent the same type. But if we build the, uh, the BEDs for them, then we find out the structures are different. So they're not the same type. It can even be arranged such that those, uh, you not only have two structures which are the same, but you have two of the exact same structure. So you can preserve corner equality under certain uh, very nice conditions as well. Uh, given two types, T1 and T2, are they disjoint? Called the BDD and, calculate the intersection, and we find that we get something which is not empty. So the intersection is not empty, so they're not disjoint. We can ask if something, if one is a subtype of the other, so we take T2 and subtract out T1, T2 and not T1, we get a non trivial tree. So T2 is not a subtype of T1. But when you do the same thing the other way, start with T1 and take away T2, then we end up with nil. So T1 is a subtype of T2. Uh, those are the operations for type to type uh, questions. What about the question of whether a given object is an element of a given type? So we have here a function which takes a BDD and an object and basically treats it as a binary tree. Test, are we at a leaf node? If not, then we walk the tree, uh, call the recursive call, the, the function makes a recursive call to itself, with either the left or the right uh, child. Okay. Testing, the, calling the common list type function with the basic type, so it's calling that with number or with string or, or uh, ratio or whatever. The nice thing about this is that type P is never called twice on the same type. So you'll never ask, is this object a number more than once? Because no path from the root to the leaf contains the same type uh, more than once in the binary tree. Um, if we have the, uh, the type expression in compile time, we actually can do even better than that. Thanks to a uh, compiler macro, we can check if we have a statically uh, expressed type expression, then we actually can expand into a piece of uh, functional uh, and precise code using tag body with four states. So there's one state per node in the binary decision diagram. And walking through this uh, with the go-tos is equivalent to walking through the binary tree. So the code will execute in linear time. Uh, and the, the size of the code is much smaller than the, the size of the entire binary tree. Um, there is a, a quote by Donald Knuth after he discovered these binary decision diagrams apparently late in life. He said, uh, binary decision diagrams are wonderful. The more I play with them, the more I love them. For 15 months, I do like a child with a new toy. Being able to solve problems that I never imagined would be practical, I suspect that many readers will have the same experience, and there will always be more to learn in this fertile, uh, fertile subject. So I, I would like to echo that, that sentiment, that uh, it's, it's really an interesting area. There's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, it doesn't solve every problem. I'm not suggesting to you that you throw away all the code that deals with type specifiers and, 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 and use this. Uh, there's lots of more research to be done. Uh, hopefully uh, a lot of fun research to be done. But it's an interesting alternative because it gives some capabilities that the native implementation as, as mentioned in the specification doesn't really, uh, doesn't really allow. So in summary, uh, we looked at two mechanisms for representing types. There's a, there's a native mechanism which has its, its usefulness. One of its usefulness of the native mechanism is it's very intuitive. And uh, the code using it is very readable, I, humble, iconic. 
but the uh, binary decision theorem all, all for interesting alternatives. Uh, the performance is, is, I would say, competitive. There are, there are many cases in our experimentations where the binary decision diagram far, far, far outperforms code written using the native approach. But uh, there also are some other cases where the native approach seems to seems to outperform the binary decision diagram approach as well. So there's more, uh, much more work to be, to be done. I'll be happy to answer anyone's questions. Yeah, so, so, the, so the question is, what is the worst case size of the, of the, of the decision diagram? So the, uh, the size actually is still exponential, but it's exponential with a much smaller exponent than, than before. So uh, every decision diagram terminates in two nodes. So it can only explode in the middle, and then it has to uh, implode going down. So it only has half the space to binarily expand. So worst case, uh, worst case I'm estimating is something like two to the n over two. Um, although I've, I've I've tried to find out the answer to that question, and I I didn't find any resource which told really what the worst case was. Um, I ran some simulations by by generating uh, random diagrams and measuring their um, their their size, and uh, and we'll, for a for a four node tree, uh, the worst case is you have 31, 32 nodes for four variables, uh, which is it's what you started with. So I don't actually know. I should have looked at which tree is it that has its worst case. But in general, uh, 20 nodes is the the average. And then it follows some Gaussian distribution. And the more the more nodes you add, it still has its Gaussian distribution. So I would actually like to know, you know what is the worst case. But the worst case, as shown in the diagram, is, is sufficiently rare. And there was another question in front. Um, yes. What types do you use? You, you um, illustrated it a number of sequences. But those are actually really human types, other types. Which types do you use to represent each node? Is it just the types in the original type expression? Ah, yes. Do okay. Expand the ones that you know. So, so um, the current implementation only uses the types which are expressed explicitly. There are other types which could be introduced yeah. to simplify it, and I don't have an implementation yet which does that. That's something so I have to do. If you say compare number with or float integer. Uh, whatever the others are. <laughs> <laughs> the represent number. Those two types are actually the same. Well, well different trees. Another interesting case is numeric ranges. Yeah, so, or just EQL and like bits. EQL and, 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 EQL bits. and member and such. Exactly. So if you have if you have a type member one, two, three, four, and a member four, five, six, seven, I don't derive the type EQL four right. and insert in there. I have enough information to do that, but I, 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 something I would very much like to do, but I haven't done yet. Yes, because then if you combine member with a member with some numbers, or the two members with the same numbers. Yes, yes, yes. Those would be the same type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, there's a, a famous paper by by Baker. I don't remember the first name, but he has a completely different approach to representing types, and he has sort of a a long list of simplifications you can do with numeric ranges and, and, and such and, and ways to do this uh, uh, he claims properly. Uh, yeah. When I read it, I can't verify if he's correct or not, but since he's standard paper, I uh, implicitly agree with what he said. Yeah. So you could, you could expand all types that you know about into the smallest possible types. Yeah, uh, uh, one issue is that the, the user doesn't have access to the expansion of death type. So some of the Types actually have a definition of simpler, yes, uh, yeah. and as a application program, I can't 
expand that type. Mm -hmm. I guess there's probably you know, uh, uh, implementation specific functions I could use, but I haven't, I haven't done that yet. Yes? When you said that you answer well, whether the types are equal, but in reality, when you say that they are not equal, it actually is don't know. Because you, you need to say that if they are not equal if this combination of types is possible. Because you, you check subtypes for two types in the tree, but if you have some complicated combination, like if you have this, 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 and this, you cannot have this, you don't have them right now. Right? Yeah, so that, that's the example that, that I showed. There are other simplifications which you can do other than this very simple one that I elected not to not to, to talk about. And uh, so all your all, all your unequal are don't know in reality, right? No, no, no. So so um, no, no. That, that's actually a a good question. I think the answer is no. But you might be right because there are there are some there are some corner cases that that you can deviously come up with a type that fools the system because of like these numeric ranges that I don't understand and, and such. So 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 it, it could be. So when you get structures that are the same, you know that they're the same. And when you get structures that are different, uh, yes, I'm not I'm not willing to bet a lot of money that there's not this. Strange uh, exotic case, yes. But that's something that I, I would like, I would like to resolve, or I'd like to find that can't be resolved. Yes. The work you've done so far is it available on Quickless or Um It's available. Do I sign? So it's not available on Quickless, uh, but it is available from. Uh, uh, the, the the paper and the uh, and there's a tech report as well that explains lots of the details. The reference of the yes, and there's a there's a um, from the the LRD. So Epita is the university that I work for, um, and you can download from 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 that site. Okay. I've only used it in uh, SPCL, so I don't know what will happen if you try it in something else. Uh, you talked about a greater example earlier. Um, about uh, even B and talk B, uh, the satisfies yes. specify, and uh, the, does your system uh, understand satisfy satisfies and uh, understand that uh, even B and talk B are predicates over numbers? No, no, no. That, that, one is the opposite of the other. No, no. To, to to do that, you would have to either have some database of yeah. of the known predicates. And that might be useful because there are some known predicates which are used often. But in general, there's no way that my code can look at the code for my fun and figure out. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, not, not in uh, automatically, but having. Uh, but, uh, but it will basically treat satisfies A and satisfies B as two types which have a possible intersection. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it, it will know that you know that X and N satisfies odd P. Is a subset of satisfies IP. Mm -hmm. When you um, when you started to uh, reduce your PDDs and you, you you came to the point where you didn't have a unique decomposition because of the underlying constraints on the on the common on the common type system, yeah. um, and, and then you chose to um, take that into account by adding more reduction rules. Yeah. So somehow in, the, in, the, in meta language, if you like, uh, another approach could be to, to just express the constraints on the common list type system in the Boolean algebra itself and add that to the, the type that you're Yes, yeah. to. Actually, that that was the uh, the first thing that I tried, and I fought with that for a long time of, of how can I take a, the the algebra of trees and and somehow factor two trees into two other trees such that when you combine them, you get this tree. And I think that can be done, but I don't want to do it. Okay. There, there's, there's a lot of research on that because BDDs are useful, extremely useful in, uh, in binary circuit generation. And this is something that you have to do in optimizing binary circuits. Uh, uh, and the, the question is, can you express this as two trees such that one is less than the other and one is the, you know, the, the least path or the critical path and the less common least path? But yes, there ought to be some elegant way to factor the tree. 
That was my first stuff, but that obviously you could do more than this. And if you know what to do that, I'd love, I'd love to, to hear it. It yeah. seems like it ought to work. Okay, I have a quick run. I have much less for questions. <laughs> the first one is, uh, did you use some, did you re-implement it from scratch of the library from the list? And uh, the second question is, uh, you started out with the main problem of VDPs, uh, which is ordering the variables. What strategy do you use uh, for variable ordering? In a sense, are you using some what information about the known type system, type system are you using to order the variables? Okay, so um, so I first looked to see if there's a BDD implementation in common list, and I found some, but the links were broken. So I wrote it my, by hand, and you can write it in 50, 60, 70 lines. So it's not rocket science. That probably is, is rocket science. It's uh, not very difficult rocket science. And the, um, so, so there's a, a system, I think, at the University of Colorado called CUD, which is 10, 15 years of research on how to express binary trees very efficiently and and so they've done a lot of work, and certainly more optimizations than I've done in you know two or three months. Uh, but the, the actual implementation is not very not very difficult. The, the the second part of the question was ordering of the variables. Order of the variables. So in order to have uh, representational equality, we don't have to have the best order. Any ordering, as long as it's consistent, uh, will 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 give you the properties that I that I want. However. There's a lot of research on looking at the tree, making decisions, and then reordering the variables to make the tree simpler. And the obvious uh, application of that is if you're trying to make an electric circuit and you want to reduce the number of transistors, then you need to reorder the tree so that there's less stuff in the tree. And that's uh, it's known to be an NP-hard problem. What is the best, the best order? There are techniques uh, that, that you could use that I haven't used. The ordering that I'm using is a, a very simple ordering where it's mostly alphabetical, but um, it orders lists whose first element is x close to x in the tree. And that's because it's very likely that you're going to have something like number 0 to infinity and number close together in the tree. So you want them to appear in an order where the subtype relationship is correct so that the reduction will occur. Okay, we need to go on to the next. Uh, so thanks everyone.